All right, well, as you can see from the uh, screen, it is our question and answer night once again. We do this once a month where people submit questions, and on the third Sunday night of the month, we address Bible questions. We haven't really ever been able to get through more than one or two, and I don't think we're going to get past tonight. Uh, it'll probably take up all of our time. I'm getting excited because, you know, we've had a lot of good submissions, though. I can't wait to get to some of them and discuss them. Uh, so keep them coming. But uh, as far as submitting questions, uh, we covered this one last week. This week it is, what is the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Word developed through the Old Testament and New Testament? Uh, well, thank you very much. You might as well have submitted. Hey, summarize the whole Bible for me while we're at it. Uh, can you explain the whole thing? Sure, it'll only take us like a thousand different lessons and then we still won't get done with it. No, but actually uh, what this is, uh, the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and the question also added God the Word, which we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, this is kind of a, a complex issue that I wrestled with for a little bit a few years ago, and I, I feel like I came to a conclusion on it that makes sense, but admittedly there are elements of this that we're never going to understand. Um, it, it, it's hard to come up with a word to talk about this. The most common word people use is the word Trinity. You know, you've heard that word before. The problem is that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. And uh, the term was actually made up by Tertullian when he was trying to explain the doctrine to Neoplatonic minds. And right away, you know, if you've ever read a discussion about the Trinity, it tends to be arcane and confusing and uses a lot of weird words that aren't in the Bible at all. And, you know, basically boils down to, well, there's one God, but there's three persons, but they're really one God. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't appeal very well to mathematically minded people. Uh, now some people have tried to fix the problem by saying, oh, well we don't, I don't say Trinity, I say members of the Godhead. Well guess what, that expression is not in the Bible either. Uh, the word Godhead is in older versions of the Bible, like the King James and the ASV, but it's not ever used to express this concept. So basically, we're forced to choose between using a word that's not in the Bible or using a word that is in the Bible in the wrong way. And neither one of those is particularly appealing of an option. And while I am all appreciative of the need to call thing, Bible things by Bible names, I am also appreciative of the irony that the word Bible itself is not in the Bible. So uh, we've got to remember that as well. Um, so, but this is an incomprehensible dilemma. If you try to understand this doctrine, you'll lose your mind. And if you try to deny this doctrine, you'll lose your soul. That's kind of not a very comforting thing to hear from people, but that's the gist of a lot of teaching that you hear on the subject. And perhaps a bigger problem that we have is not what, but so what? You know, there's this eternal, all-powerful, all-loving God who created the universe and who decided that he loves us, and he loved us so much he gave his son to die for us. But the fundamental principle and truth about himself is that he wishes to convey he's three people. Oh. Well, I mean, where's the scripture that emphasizes that? Is it merely a doctrine to be believed because it's true? At some point we need to move past what to so what. Now the first thing I want to address on here is, by the way, how many people can't see this? Sorry. That's what happens when I do things like that. Anyhow, yeah, that's what the, the question submitted is. First thing I want to address up here is that God the Word and God the Son are actually one and the same. Uh, that was a, a clever attempt to draw a distinction, but there really isn't one. And there's several passages. All the passages that refer to God as the Word are clearly talking about Jesus. For instance, in John chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The Word was God. Well, that sounds exciting. Who is this Word? Well, if you keep reading, you get down to verse 14 of John 1. It says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, the Word became flesh. What's that a reference to? 
How many, when does God ever become flesh? The only instance I know of is in Jesus Christ. We actually just sang about it. You know, Christ alone who took on flesh. Fullness of God and helpless babe. And he, John goes on. He writes that John, in this case he's speaking about John the Baptist, John testified about him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace... For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Uh, another passage that addresses the same idea is in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 describes this mighty warrior, this rider on the white horse, and it describes it in such a way that there's no other person he could be talking about other than Jesus. I saw heaven open. I'm starting in verse 11 of Revelation 19. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe, dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, everything that gets said about him in this passage is stuff that's applied to Jesus elsewhere in Revelation. From the descriptions of the resurrected Christ in chapter 1 to the idea that the Lamb is Lord of Lords and King of Kings in chapter 17. Uh, once again, you have a clear association where the Word of God and Jesus are one and the same. Uh, so, to answer the last part first, the relationship between God the Son and God the Word is that they're one and the same. That was the easy part. Uh, the slightly more difficult part boils down to this question, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity... Now, I'm not going to try to prove that it's true tonight because that wasn't technically what the question was. I prepared a handout. And this handout is basically the, uh, the proof texts, if you will, uh, that will settle this question. One, two, three, four. Uh, you, I'm not going to expect you to read all this right here because there's a lot of it. And uh, uh, basically, this is just kind of a commended to you for your reference and hopes that it will be beneficial to somebody here. Uh, but I crammed all of it onto one piece of, sh of paper, one piece of paper on uh, front and back. The, but the idea, the doctrine of the Trinity basically rests on four, the fact that the Bible independently for, affirms four things. First of all, the Bible is clear there's only one God. Can't deny that. Secondly, the Bible is clear that Jesus is God. And I emphasized on the handout, when we say Jesus is God, He is Yahweh in the Old Testament sense of the word. Sometimes you get the impression from talking to people that they think that Jehovah or Yahweh is only a name for the Father, and that He has a Son who doesn't have that name. That's not true. Jesus is clearly Yahweh. The most telling evidence is how many times the New Testament will quote the Old Testament and quote a passage about Yahweh, the Lord, in all caps, and apply it to Jesus or use it interchangeably with Jesus. So, so I mean, our, our friends and the Jehovah's Witnesses who want to say that you know, Jehovah is only a name for the Father are sadly overlooking a key piece of evidence on this point. Third, the Spirit of God is Yahweh, and He's distinct. Uh, he's not merely, He's not an it, He's a He. Uh, that's kind of a uh, difficult thing to hammer on. You know, some people get this idea that the Spirit is like the Force in Star Wars, where, you know, He can, it just, it's not really a distinct personage, it's more like a, an extension of God, like the finger of God, or the arm of God. But no, the Bible is clear, you know, He's a distinct personage with feelings and the capacity for relationship. And there's quite a few passages that talk about that. And the fourth thing we need to realize is that even though there's one God, and even though the Son and Spirit are, all, are both God, that somehow Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct, and they all have relationships with one another. 
Now this is where we get into a little bit of trouble. Because those points seem to contradict one another, don't they? They seem to kind of butt heads. Now we can, we can respond to that in one of two ways. We can either try to deny one of those four truths, which, I mean, the handout is basically kind of an answer to that, a way of saying that you can't deny any of the four truths. Or we can accept that there's a piece of the puzzle that we're missing that we don't fully comprehend or get our minds around and just sort of be content that we have this paradox about God and who He is, that He is one and yet He is relational. I guess the word relational is not in the Bible either. This is hard. Let's use a biblical affirmation that does make sense. How do you do, what word do we use? I realize I've been talking and this isn't, an, uh, this isn't uh, restricted for them. You can, uh, you can comment or raise questions as we go along. But if we were to talk about the one word that defines any relationship to its deepest level, what is that word? Fellowship. Fellowship? Okay, good. What else? Love. Love. That's a big one. God. What, what would you say about the relationship between God and love? God is love. It's so important that it's said twice, right? In 1 John chapter 4. And I think that that's a good chunk of what the, this teaching is really trying to express. You know, the Bible never says the word Trinity, but it does say that God is love. It says it twice. In 1 John chapter 4. In verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It doesn't say God has love, it says He is love. It's a little perplexing, but you know, we move on. Verse 16 we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. When we talk about the Father and the Son, what is the defining feature of their relationship? Love. You look on the back of the handout I gave you, and Father, Son, and Spirit, the, the thing we're told the most information about is the relationship that exists between Jesus and and his Father. Jesus speaks about something in John 17 in verse 5. The glory that we had together before the world was. I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? We, I don't think we can get our minds around that. We have things in this life that are analogous to it that we could sort of look at and compare and say, well, it's greater than this or it's bigger than this. But when Jesus says, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was, we're looking at something that existed before we ever did. We're looking at a glimpse into what was going on in eternity before the world ever existed. You want to talk about tracing this through the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament tells us about the beginning of the world. The New Testament tells us about a little bit about what was going on before the beginning of the world. We don't know a lot, but we know that before the beginning of the world, there was a Father and there was a Son, and they had glory together. They had love together. What do we think about that love? Was it imperfect? Was it lacking in some way? No! It was perfect just the way it is. God was, I guess, perfectly content and happy in that realm of existence. We don't know a lot, but we know that what God had was so glorious it was greater than anything we've ever comprehended in this life. It raises a question, doesn't it? Did God need to create us? No. God did not need to create us. When we start reflecting on who God is and what He was before the beginning, it tells us something, that our mere existence is an act of grace. It's like, you know, a mother and a father. Why do they have children? Well, you know, because they want... To, well, they want to express their capacity for relationship. They have love with themselves. Hopefully it's a good kind of love if it's a husband-wife relationship. They have love within themselves, but they want to share that. They want to invite people to participate in that. And the doctrine of the Trinity, and I'm using that word because it's shorthand, well, the main point of it when it's all said and done is God, ha God is love, 
But he doesn't want to stop there. He wants us to participate in it. He is inviting us to be participants in his capacity for love. Now that is huge. That's just mind-boggling. And getting my head around, I'm still trying to get my head around that. You know, I, sometimes people will bring up, you know, well, maybe the Father, Son, and Spirit, they're not really distinct. Maybe they're just three different ways of talking about the same being. It doesn't make sense, though. Perhaps the most telling piece of evidence against that is the fact that Jesus prays to the Father over and over and over and over and over. How does Jesus pray to the Father if they're, one, if they're the same person? Well, you know, there's some kind of interaction there. Jesus not only prayed, He prayed more than any other human being has ever prayed on the face of the earth. And what in the world did He have to talk about? Well, quite a bit when you consider the closeness that He has. Now, we have something that's analogous to that in our lives. We know what the relationship between a parent and a child is like. Because we've all had parents, and some of us have had children. How many of you would say your relationship with your parents was perfect? Nobody. Nobody can say that. Some people have had pretty good relationships with their parents. Some people have really bad relationships with their parents. Same thing goes the other way. Some people have really good relationships with their children. Some people have really bad relationships with their children. But we know, even though we don't have an experience of that relationship in perfection, we can sort of imagine what it would be like, can't we? And from there, we can imagine that the love between the Father and the Son must be even greater than that. You know, so that, that, that's kind of, again, we have to think in terms of greater than, greater than. Um... You know, there's a lot more that could be said about uh, the relation. Okay, I allowed my handouts to interfere with my notes. Shouldn't do that. You all laugh at me. No, but uh, okay, a lot of this is the same kind of thing. I think that the bottom line on this, a lot of Trinitarian discussion is about what God is not, and that's not what we want to focus on. What we want to focus on is what God is. You know, God is not a lot of things. God is not lonely without us, for instance, because this relationship has always existed. God isn't bored without us. Um, the Father and Son have delighted in each other, but God is love. Um, so why is all this important? Let's talk about the relationship that exists there. Alright? And get to draw pictures. I don't know if the camera's on the board or not, but I'm hoping that people at least see this. Alright, so you have a father... And you have a son. Now most of the time, in our human experience, whenever a father has a son, that means that at some point in his life, he wasn't a father. And then at some point in his life, he begat a son, he had a son, and then now he became a father. That's our human experience. Is that the case with God? Well, no, it's not. There's never been a time when the Father was not the Father. And there's never been a time when the Son did not exist. As far as we're concerned, as far as eternity is concerned, the Father and the Son have always had this Father-Son relationship. Now that's a little weird, because we don't have a frame of reference to compare it to. We've never been in a Father-Son relationship where it's always existed. We've never seen on earth a Father-Son relationship that had no beginning point. And yet... We, we need to sort of realize that there's this perpetual state of fromness. Uh, you know, where I will use the word begotten because that kind of that describes the relationship between a father and a son. A son is begotten by a father, but it didn't happen at a point in time. It just simply describes how one stands in relation to the other. There's a kind of a now that father son relationship implies things like subordination and obedience. The Bible affirms that too. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about how God is the head of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how Christ will hand over the kingdom or the rule to the Father. Uh, so there is, they're not exactly the same. Well, how does the Spirit fit into all this? Is the Spirit like a third cousin in this whole mix? Is that how we're supposed to understand this? How would the Spirit relate to the Father? Let's ask another question. What is spirit? What does that word mean, even? 
Anybody remember? Hmm? Breath. Breath. Wind. Whenever the Bible talks, uh, the word for spirit and the word for wind or breath are the same word. That's true in Greek. That's true in Hebrew. Uh, that's true in every biblical language. So if we're going to describe the relationship between the Father and the Son in a perpetual state of begotten, what word might we use to describe the relationship between the Father and the Spirit? You know, how, how, can we, how can we describe the, the eternal fromness in that sense? Yeah, you know, we might think of him as being breathed. Just like, just like begottenness is that you know, you're from somebody when you're begotten by them. Well, your breath is from you when you breathe it out. Now, again, we have a distinct personage. And we're sort of being... Comp this is sort of being explained to us in human terms. It's hard to get our minds around that. But just to understand that that's there. These relationships... It wasn't like one day the father was not breathing and then the next day he had breath. That's not how that works. Just like when a child is born, you know, a child is born and then he starts breathing. But it's not so with the father. The father has always existed and he's always had his spirit, his breath. So there's that to keep in mind as well. I hope that was helpful. I don't know if it was or not, but it's just us trying to get our heads around that is the trick. Why it, the reason God is called Father isn't because... Isn't it, it, I mean, He adopts us as children. That's true. But was He a Father before He adopted us? Well, yeah, He was. There's a sense in which God is Father in the universal brotherhood of man type creation thing. Uh, but would God have been Father if He had chosen not to create? Well, yeah, He would be. Because His fatherhood is ultimately eternal. You know, fatherhood is ultimately described in terms of this father-son relationship that exists here. You know, when we talk about God being a father, we don't need we don't we shouldn't be thinking of it in terms of uh, picturing God as this old man with a white beard and a, uh, more like a cosmic grandpa than a father, really. Um, that's not really the idea. It's because he's called father because he's presupposed by this relationship with Jesus. Have we ever seen the Father? No. So one person said no. Anybody want to dispute that and say yes? I'm just curious. Have we ever seen the Father? Has anyone ever seen the Father? Oh, okay. The same person who said no also said yes. And the Bible actually says both. Uh, on the one hand... Um, Jesus says in John 5.37, You have neither heard His voice at any time nor seen His form. But Jesus also told His disciples later, If you have seen Me, you have seen the Father. John 14, verse 7, verse 9. Um, there's a couple of other things we might look at. Um, what about the Son? Well, we wouldn't even know there was a such thing as the Trinity if we didn't know about the Son. Uh, God, and this is where the Old Testament, New Testament thing comes into play. There isn't any explicit evidence of this idea in the Old Testament. There isn't any explicit evidence of it. There might be some implicit evidence, but you wouldn't have drawn the conclusion without knowing what the New Testament said first. That's the, the real key to this whole thing. Nobody could have anticipated that this was what God was from just reading the Old Testament alone. Uh, it's an idea that doesn't get cast into full relief until Jesus shows up on the scene. Now here's a pop quiz for you. Does the Old Testament ever talk about God having a son? Anybody remember? Yes? No? Okay, prof you know, there are some prophecies that talk about it. Oh yeah, Daniel chapter 7 uses son of man to refer to Jesus. But does God ever spoken of as having a son in the Old Testament? That's not the answer I'm looking for, John, but thank you for your attempt to participate. Uh, huh? 
good try. That's right. Yes. The answer to the question is yes. The Old Testament does speak about God having a son. In Exodus chapter 4, for instance, it says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And he tells Pharaoh, if you don't let my firstborn son go, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. Psalm 2, speaking about the anointed king of Israel, the Lord said, you are my son, today I have begotten you. 2 Samuel 7, 14, God was speaking of, to, of David's descendant when he said, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. That's 2 Samuel 7, 14. There's a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 17 that says something very similar. There might, there's a few other passages that talk about God having a son as well. Alright, other question. Does the Old Testament ever talk about God's spirit? Mm-hmm. It's all over the place. It's actually in Genesis chapter 1. Go back and read Genesis 1 verse 2. The Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters. Joel 2, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Isaiah 44. And it talks about God pouring out His Spirit. Ezekiel 36, I will put a new heart within them and put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. And on and on we could go. There's hundreds of passages that talk about the Spirit of God coming on people. Do you know what's fascinating about all of that? In the first century, the Jews did not believe in the existence of a, a I don't know what the, the two word is, the duality or the bienity or whatever you would call it. Well, why not? Because in the Old Testament, it is not clear that the Son that God is talking about is divine. And it is not clear that the Spirit that is being talked about is a distinct personage. That information isn't made clear until you get to the New Testament. That's kind of mind-boggling in some ways. You know, there are passages, again, that people will quote and say, well, look at this in retrospect. This must be talking about the Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, a good chunk of them are in Isaiah. For instance, um, Isaiah chapter 61. I've quoted this one a few times before in talking about the Gospel of Luke. Isaiah 61, in verse 1, says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Alright, so the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Who's the me that's talking here, by the way? You know? It's like that classic question of whom does the prophet speak, of himself or of someone else? No, it's a little ambiguous if you read Isaiah by himself. But if you read the New Testament, Jesus quotes this passage in Luke chapter 4 when he's giving his first synagogue sermon. And he says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He says that uh, Jesus claims he is the me of this Isaiah song. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You know, so there he views the Lord, spirit, and himself. Well, there's all three of them right there together. There's a few other old um, Isaiah passages that talk about that. Um, for instance, Isaiah 42. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold. Well, the I here speaking is clearly God. He talks about having a servant. My chosen one in whom my soul delights. What is God going to do with his servant? He says, I will put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, how in the world do you figure that? Well, you've got, again, I, my servant, and my spirit. Those three together. So what's the relationship there? Well, you have I, the father, and then the son, or in this case, the servant, and then the spirit. There's something else we need to realize and appreciate, too. Sometimes uh, the terminology for father, son, and spirit gets moved around a little bit. For instance, the son is sometimes called the servant of the Lord. Uh, whenever you read the New Testament, frequently the term God is used for the Father. That's not without exception. Sometimes Jesus is called God. And in the New Testament, Lord is very commonly used as a designation for Jesus or Christ. Um, in fact, I, I have a friend who you know, really digs into some of these things here and there. He told me one time that and I haven't verified this myself, but he told me he did a search. Every instance of the word Lord in the New Testament 
either it's a quote from the Old Testament or it's a reference to Jesus. Now, I don't know if that's true. I haven't verified that. Uh, it is a pretty fascinating issue in and of itself. Uh, and this was in the context of an argument about whether we can pray to Jesus, too. So it's kind of another complex issue. And some people are more invested in that argument than they should be. Um, but all that to say, what, we're, what we've got here is there is some kind of relationship going on. Now, what one does, another frequently does. But that's not true without exception. Let's... Let's, uh, let's look at it in terms of how they relate to humanity, in terms of the human race. We'll put us down here. We're humanity. All right. Has the Father ever come and dwelt among humanity? No. What about the Son? Yes, the Son has come and dwelt among humanity. What about the Spirit? Also, yes, the Spirit has come as well. They didn't come at the same time. You know, their coming were two distinct actions. But even the way they came is different. You think about it. The Son, the Son came and the Son became flesh and dwelt among us as one of us. The Spirit didn't do that. The Spirit was poured out on flesh and dwells within us. That's the difference right there. Okay? The Son... When he came, what was the main thing he did when he came to earth? He died for our sins. He sacrificed himself for our sins, right? Did the Spirit do that? No. But the Spirit does something else, doesn't he? He sanctifies us. He washes us. He cleanses us from sin. There's quite a few, old, oh, there's quite a few passages that talk about that, like in Titus 3, in verse 5, or 1 Corinthians 6, in verse 11. Uh, this is where it really helps to be familiar with what the Bible says about the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's work isn't something that we're left in the dark about. When Jesus came, He says that his, he, he refers to His own body as the temple of God. Now the temple of God, what was the point of the temple? What was the main job the temple had? It was the place where God dwelt. Right. Jesus was God dwelling among men. He Himself was the temple. The Spirit is not called the temple, but instead the Spirit dwells in the temple. And what temple is it that the Spirit dwells in? Us. Exactly. And that's true both personally, you know, do you not know that your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit? And also collectively, the church is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's made up of believers, living stones. Okay, so Jesus was the temple of God in His body. The Spirit dwells in the temple of God, which is our bodies. Jesus rose from the dead. The Spirit didn't die, but He did raise Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Where is Jesus right now? He's sitting at God's right hand. He's seated and ruling on God's right hand. He's resting and waiting, if you will. Where's the Spirit right now? In us. He's currently received by us. He currently rests on us. Alright, so... Appreciating those distinctions, well, we realize that you know, the Father uses the Son and the Spirit both to save us. He uses the Son for His atoning sacrifice to save us, and the Spirit to cleanse us to save us. That's a big part of the relationship. That's not speculative. That's all over the Bible. So, can we understand everything? No. But we can understand this, and that is a very fundamental truth. And I realize that triangular diagrams are... Um, I, I used to have a kind of a phobia about triangular diagrams of this kind of thing. But the idea is that God sent His Son, He sent His Spirit, and they both have a work in our lives. Now, they do have some things in common, too. Both the Son and the Spirit are said to intercede for us. The Son intercedes for us in Romans 8.34, the Spirit in Romans 8.26 and 27. Um, who are we baptized into? Well, scripture affirms that we're baptized into Christ, but elsewhere, it also talks about us being baptized in the Spirit. They're really just the same thing, ultimately. Both Christ and the Spirit dwell in us. The New Testament talks over and over again about Christ in you and the Spirit in you. In fact, Romans 8 uses these expressions interchangeably. Romans 8, verses 9-11. through 11. 
You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And on and on and on we could go. Um, there's a lot of different commonalities we could point out as well as uh, differences. There's a... Yeah, we're not getting through all this tonight. But I hope that something I've said has been beneficial uh, anyway. Um, you have something, Don? That's a typo. It should say the son's work is completed. Yes, thank you, Don. Um, yeah, no, that's a typo. Um, you can blame that on the guy that wrote the handout. Uh, it should say, and the, the, the last point, before, well, the last sub-point before the last point, it should say the son sends the spirit for believers. This happens at Pentecost after the son's work is completed. The son's work is completed in the sense of Hebrews chapter 10, where it talks about how you know he's made atonement, and whenever a priest's work is done, he sits down. Christ sat down at the right hand of God, waiting until all enemies would be subjected to his feet. Yes, thank you, Don. Uh, anyway. Proof that somebody read the handout. Uh, I was talking about it. Uh, you know, there, the thing about this is, at the end of the day, we might ask a question, so what? Well, a good chunk of it, it boils down to you know, what is the gospel really about? What does this have to do with the gospel? And the main message of the gospel is, I am saved by Jesus. But how did Jesus save me? Well, he died on the cross for my sins. That's the question behind the question. The only problem is that that raises another question. Who is Jesus? Who must Jesus be if he can even do something like that? Okay, so we start thinking about it and we read the Bible and the Bible answers that question for us. That Jesus must be God in the flesh come and dwelling among us. But then we have another question behind the question, another background assumption that has to be filled in. Who must God be if Jesus is even able to act in such a way? And this is the background question behind the background question. This is the question that, you know, it's not, it's not like the, the New Testament comes out and say, tries to explain this systematically. What it does is it kind of assumes it. And there's a lot in our Christian life that kind of assumes it. You know, you don't hear a lot of preaching about, you know, God is one God and three persons. And because at the end of the day, it's an assumption behind the message of the gospel. It needs to, it is the final ground of all of it. And in order, to, I, I think we need to appreciate that element of it. It's reflected in the songs we sing. Even if we struggle with this, we have a, a poetic appreciation for it. Uh, there's a song I noticed, for instance, you know, the song Revive Us Again uh, talks about some of these very concepts. We're not going to sing it for just now, but I wanted to look at it because we were singing it the other day and it just sort of hit me how this song sums up the ideas we've been talking about. You know, we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. That's talking about what the Son primarily does. He died for us. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Now, the Spirit comes, who reveals Jesus to us, convicts us of sin, and does all those other things. But then it goes back, and the next two verses again talk about the Son and the Spirit. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins, and has cleansed every stain. There again is the work of the Son, you know, personified as a Lamb. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Now that's again an attempt to uh, poetically invoke the Spirit's imagery and coming upon people and, uh, you know, I guess in the form of tongues of fire and lighting up fire within them. But that's, it just sort of hit me when we were singing about it. You know, we have a, a, an assumptive appreciation for this. Even if we have a hard time fully comprehending the specifics of the paradox. Anyhow, 
There's a lot more that could be said, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and conclude it tonight. If anybody has any other insights they want to share, now would be a good time to do it. Um, I hope that this was beneficial. Uh, next time we probably won't spend all our time on just one question, uh, but I did want to spend some time on this because it's, it is something I think we need to have an appreciation for. And I hope that we, we have a better understanding of the gospel and a better, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to walk away from this and just completely change everything we're doing Monday morning at work. But we will perhaps have a deeper appreciation of what God has been doing, what He's been doing since the beginning. Now maybe, as we conclude tonight, I'll we'll read a passage from Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 says that, I'm going to start in verse 3. While we were children, we were being held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that we might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That's the invitation. You want to be a son of God? You want to participate in this relationship and be an heir of the eternal promise? Because that's why the Son and the Spirit and the Father all act in this way. To bring us into that relationship with them. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not living your life in that relationship with the Lord. Maybe your life is not right with the Lord. Maybe you haven't been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Maybe you haven't had His Spirit fill your heart and cleanse you of sin. Maybe you haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of sin so that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever the case may be, now is an appropriate time to make known what your need is and to let it be known here in this assembly while we stand together and while we sing. Well.